In Peru, technocrat and congressman Francisco Sagasti was sworn in as president this Tuesday. Turkey's parliament granted President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's government permission to deploy peacekeepers to Azerbaijan. In South Sudan, UN officials said 400 people have been abducted in criminal conflicts in the past six months. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm Gladys Quesada. And we begin in Peru, where the technocrat and congressman Francisco Sagasti was sworn in as president this Tuesday. The former World Bank official was sworn in before the first magistrate of Peru after being appointed president of the Congress on Monday. Sagasti headed the list of candidates presented by the Purple Party to form the Board of Directors of the Congress, a proposal that was approved on Monday by legislators with 97 votes in favor and 26 against. Sagasti, a university professor, engineer and advisor, will be Peru's third president in the past week, following the outsting of Martin Vizcarra and the forced resignation of his successor, Manuel Merino, in the midst of widespread protests against the pervasive corruption of the political elite that have left at least two dead. And the new Peruvian president dedicated his first words before Congress to the young people who were killed during the protest that forced Manuel Merino's resignation from the presidency. I thank Congress, I thank citizens for this top appointment, but this gratitude is also a commitment these are my first words, and I use them to remember the young citizens, Jack Brian Pintado Sanchez and Jordan Inti Sotelo Camargo, who unfortunately died during recent days, and who expressed and saw citizens' mobilizations carried out in the legitimate exercise of the fundamental right to protest. In this sense, the newly installed president of Peru apologized to the relatives of the dead and to all the young people who have marched in defense of democracy. We cannot give life back to these young people, but we can prevent it from happening again. We can also strongly support the injured, some of them seriously injured, in the name of the state. I asked their families for forgiveness and to them and all the young people who marched to defend democracy and made us remember, many of us who are already old, the importance of the vocation of the service. And President Francisco Sagasti stressed that in these turbulent times, one must take the initiative to bring about the necessary change to overcome the crisis. In these moments of crisis without precedence and sharpened by this catastrophe and by the problems that our country has, the economic, health, social and security problems, it is fundamental, it is absolutely necessary to maintain calm, the peace and composure. But please do not confuse this with passivity, with conformism or with resignation. On the contrary, let's assume these turbulent times as call for action to the commitment of all Peruvians of good will to change this situation and to overcome the crisis. Iora downgrades to tropical depression over El Salvador as threats of catastrophic flash flooding and mudslides continue in the region. Life-threatening flash flooding and river flooding is expected through, this, through Thursday across portions of Central America due to heavy rainfall from Iora. Flooding and mudslides across portions of Honduras, Nicaragua and Guatemala could be exacerbated by saturated soils in place, resulting in significant to potentially catastrophic impacts. The Minister and Director of Nicaragua's National System for the Prevention, Mitigation of Attention to Disasters, Dr. Guillermo Gonzalez, has described Iora as the most powerful hurricane to have hit the Central American country. Iota is possibly the most powerful hurricane that has made landfall, so to speak, in our national territory. However, as we had planned, we are working from different scenarios to respond to what its passage through the country implies. 
This means that even though its strength as a hurricane has reduced, and today it has become a tropical storm, we still maintain the warnings that were decreed approximately two weeks ago with the arrival of Hurricane Eta. Given that the passage of the hurricane will continue to cause intense rain in the mountains of northern Nicaragua, and this can cause flat floodings and landslides again, which we must also protect the population living in these regions, as we have done. Likewise, the Nicaraguan minister highlighted the preparation and training of citizens to face such weather events, which affect the most vulnerable sectors of the population. An important element that we have to highlight is that all the work that our government has been doing to prepare for emergency situations like this. First, they have been working on training the population for more than a decade so that the population understands this type of phenomenon, acts early to protect their lives in a very organized way at the level of each family, their community, and in full coordination with all government institutions to guarantee that there are no human lives lost in this type of circumstances. This is precisely what has happened during recent days, and we must remember that we already had Hurricane Eta. Former President of Bolivia, Evo Morales, announced this Tuesday that he will assume the presidency of the movement towards socialism after an agreement was reached between the national and departmental leaders of the political organization. I want to inform of the consensus. We have decided that from this moment, Evo assumes the presidency of the movement towards socialism, political instrument for the sovereignty of the peoples. And the former president informed that the meeting will be held with various political and social organizations this coming November 24th to analyze the candidacies for the departmental elections scheduled for March the 7th, 2021. We have decided to call an emergency meeting of the National Mass IPSP that will be held on the 21st of this month, here in the city of Cochabamba. I convene the national leadership of the movement towards socialism, a political instrument for the liberation of the people, always accompanied by the most important social movements in the formation of this great political movement for liberation. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Turkey's parliament on Tuesday granted President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's government permission to deploy peacekeepers to Azerbaijan to monitor a ceasefire deal between Azerbaijan and Armenia that aims to end the conflict in the region. In a show of hands, legislators voted in favor of a one-year mandate allowing the government to send troops to Azerbaijan, where they will observe possible violations of the truce from a joint Turkish-Russian monitoring center. The ceasefire ended six weeks of intense fighting between Azerbaijan and Armenia over the Nagorno-Karabakh region. Discussions on the presidential bill have concluded. Now I will submit the bill for your approval. Those who accept, those who do not accept, they are yes have it. According to the agreement reached, in order to audit if the ceasefire in the lands of Azerbaijani is holding or not, which was recently freed from an occupation, we will create a joint center as per request of Azerbaijan, but Turkey's and Russia's joint involvement was recognized. And the U.S. President Donald Trump has fired the director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, Chris Krebs. President Trump tweeted this Tuesday that he had dismissed Krebs, claiming that his recent statement about the security of the 2020 election was highly incorrect, as once again repeating his unfounded claims that there were massive irregularities and electoral fraud.
Moments after the publication, Twitter tagged the Trump's tweets, noting that the claims about voter fraud are disputed. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency published a statement on November the 12th, in which it described this year's presidential election as the safest in American history, stressing that there is no evidence that any voting system eliminated or lost votes, switched votes, or was compromised in any way. The U.S. is set to slash its troop levels in Afghanistan and Iraq to their lowest levels in nearly 20 years of war after President Donald Trump pledged to end conflicts abroad. Acting Defense Secretary Chris Miller said around 2,000 troops will be pulled from Afghanistan by January the 5th and 500 more will come back from Iraq, leaving 2,500 in each country. Miller said the U.S. had met its goals set in 2001 after the Al-Qaeda attacks on the United States to defeat Islamist extremists and to help local partners and allies to take the lead in the fight. The announcement came 10 days after Trump fired Defense Secretary Mark Casper, who had insisted on the need to keep 4,500 troops in Afghanistan to support the Kabul government while it negotiates a peace deal with the Taliban. U.S. troops had already been cut by nearly two-thirds from about 13,000 this year, following the February 29th peace deal between the United States and the Taliban. This is consistent with our established plans and strategic objectives supported by the American people and does not equate to a change in U.S. policy or objectives. And we all will execute this repositioning in a way that protects our fighting men and women, our partners in the intelligence community and diplomatic corps, and our superb allies that are critical to rebuilding Afghan and Iraqi security capabilities and civil society. Almost 100,000 alleged victims of sexual abuse within the Boy Scouts of U.S. have come forward to claim compensation from the organization. A lawyer from the plaintiffs described the move as the biggest ever U.S. sexual abuse case. The American organization has apologized to victims, saying it was devastated. Negotiations will now begin between the alleged victims, the BSA, and their insurers. The organization still has a considerable membership of more than 2 million youth participants, ranging in age from 5 to 21. In terms of current deport reported numbers, the case dwarfs similar complaints made against the Catholic Church in the U.S. In 2012, the Los Angeles Times newspaper uncovered about 5,000 files detailing allegations against scoutmasters and troop leaders who had been deemed ineligible volunteers. Most incidents had not been reported to the police and the organization had simply taken itself with removing those accused. The French capital has seen protests against a proposed security law amid fears it will curb press freedom. Hundreds of people gathered in Paris near the National Assembly, in particular representatives of journalist unions and human rights associations, to protest against the French government's proposed global security law, which they say will prevent journalists and citizens from filming law enforcement officials during demonstrations. The new legislation from President Emmanuel Macron's government proposes reforms such as giving more autonomy to local police, as well as making it a crime to show images of an officer's face unless it has been blurry, a measure long sought by police unions. It has no other goal than to prevent journalists from filming the police forces and immediately broadcasting the images especially live. If you were there live and there were policemen behind me, you wouldn't be able to film anymore. I will take the example of Cédric Chouvet, this 42-year-old delivery man who died following a crushing of his larynx by police officers. Remember that the prefecture of the police had said that he had died of a simple heart attack. Without the videos of these police officers broadcast on social networks, we wouldn't have had the truth. We know very well that without all the courageous journalists or video makers who were able to film the exactions during the Yellow Vest protest, during the Venal affair, Genevieve Legay, information would not circulate. So for me, it's a liberticidal law. 
On Tuesday, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi spoke on terrorism and the need to reform global institutions while addressing the 12th BRICS summit virtually. Terrorism is the biggest problem the world is facing. We have to make sure that countries that share the terrorists and support them are also held responsible. We have to fight this problem in an organized manner. The world is seeing major geostrategic changes, the effects of which will continue to impact stability, security and growth. The role of BRICS will be vital in all three areas. Global institutions are outdated and still function with the mindset and realities from 75 years ago. India feels that reforms in the UN Security Council is very important. We expect support from our BRICS partners on this issue. Global stability, shared security and innovative growth is the theme of the international meeting shared by Russia. The leaders of the bloc's member countries are set to discuss cooperation and key issues in the global context, such as the reform of the multilateral system measures to mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, trade, health, energy, the fight against terrorism and exchanges between peoples. India is to assume the presidency of BRICS for the third time. The previous occasions were in 2012 and 2016. France has now passed the mark of 2 million confirmed COVID-19 cases since the start of the epidemic. Meanwhile, the Director General of Health reported this Tuesday that 437 new coronavirus fatalities were confirmed in the past 24 hours, taking the death toll to pass 46,000. With a particularly high number of people hospitalized, which yesterday reached an unprecedented number, of 33,500 COVID patients hospitalized. To date, France has more than 8,000 intensive care patients, 4,854 COVID patients, and 3,300 non-COVID patients. The health crisis at COVID-19 has revealed the psychological vulnerability of many French people, with a significant increase in depressive states. The number of people concerned doubled between the end of September and the beginning of November. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. UN says 400 people have been abducted in communal conflicts in the past six months in South Sudan in the country's struggles to emerge from years of war. More than 100 people, 1,000 people have been killed in the country during the same time period. The country is struggling to emerge from years of ruinous civil war, which broke out two years after gaining independence in 2011 and formally ended with the creation of a power-sharing government in February. The conflict has killed an estimated of 400,000 people, forced millions from their homes and wreck infrastructure in the oil-producing country. In Somalia, a suicide bomb attack at a restaurant in the capital Mogadishu has left some dead and other wounded. A suicide bomber blew himself up at a restaurant in the Hamar Jajab district, not far away from Somalia's General Kaheye Police Academy, killing at least five people at the spot and injuring eight others. The Palestinian government alerted the international community on Tuesday that Israel continues to build Ill illegal settlements in the occupied West Bank. 
Prime Minister Mohamed Stayed stressed that the Zionist state is in a race against the time to advance new construction on Palestinian land before the end of U.S. President Donald Trump's administration. He also denounced that if the Israeli annexation plan is implemented against sovereign territories, it will harm the possibility of the formation of a Palestinian state and the security of all its citizens. The United Nations Security Council Resolution 2334, adopted in December 2016, affirms that Israel's settlements have no legal validity and constitute a flagrant violation of international law. The occupied and blockaded Gaza Strip is facing a rise in COVID-19 cases, with 486 infections reported in the last 24 hours, one of the highest figures since the pandemic broke out in March. The Strip, frequently bombarded by the occupying Israeli regime, home to around 2 million people, faces a second and more severe wave of the pandemic, with scarce resources and a fragile health infrastructure to face the challenges, thanks to the constant attacks by Tel Aviv. As a whole, Palestine has confirmed almost, than, almost more than 65,000 COVID-19 cases and over 500 patients have died from the disease. According to the New York Times, U.S. President Donald Trump asked senior advisors last Thursday about potential options for attacking Iran's main nuclear site. According to the revelations, the president was dissuaded from moving ahead with a strike by advisors who warned that it could escalate into a broader conflict in his last week in office. The White House has not commented on the accounts of the meeting. In 2018, the Trump administration withdrew from the landmark 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action on Iran nuclear deal. The deal saw the U.S. and five other world powers offer Iran relief from crippling economic sanctions in return for the limits on its nuclear program. Tehran has also insisted that its nuclear program is linked to energy and not intended to build any weapons. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. Also, join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.